Is that on? Okay, cool. Remembering how to do stuff after having to do like Zoom conferences for a really long time is such a weird feeling. All right, use a separate display. Can you switch to my desktop if it's over there? Oh, it's over there, cool. Okay, this is sort of working. Uh, let's bring this over here. I swear I did a tech track. Uh, is that full screen? It is not full screen. All right, there we go. All right, hello. Um, hi, everybody. My talk today is called The 90s Called and They Want Their Websites Back. Um, we're going to be talking about basically the history of the evolution of the personal website, the technology that improved it over time, and how current website development, in my opinion, uh, has circled back around to the same feeling of how it was to make a personal site in the late 90s slash early 2000s, but I couldn't fit that all in the title. <laughs> so to start things off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and the kind of work that I do. Um, my name is Rachel White. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Oho, though I don't really post a lot about tech, uh, but if you like Nicolas Cage or professional wrestling, then you are in luck. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a technical evangelist at Datadog. So I'd like to show you one thing of my previous work to sort of give you an idea where I'm coming from when I create new projects or talks and why I'm motivated to show these kinds of things in a conference setting. So this is RoboKitty, and after I went to a conference, JSConf US in 2014, and I saw everybody speaking, I was by myself, I did not know anyone, um, and where I worked, my colleagues were mean to me. So I was just like being by myself and checking everything out, and I was like, I wanna speak at conferences, and obviously that worked out well for me. Um, but I decided to, you know, try and build something that I'd never built before. I'd never worked with robotics. I'd never worked with Node.js at the time. And so on, in 2015, I started building this. But what I did first is I submitted the talk and the abstract to the conference. And I was like, OK, if it gets accepted, then I'll build it. And don't do that, because you always get accepted. And then you have to end up building it anyway. Um, yeah, so it's a really simple, straightforward Node.js, Node bots thing. It's built out of cardboard, has a servo dispense cat food. I brought candy to the conference so that people could, you know, get candy instead of cat food. Um, it, was, it was really accessible for people that had never, you know, maybe wanted to speak at a conference and they wanted to figure out how they could do that or how to get into Node and how to get into Nodebots. And I made sure that my readme was like the most verbose thing ever. So like even if you didn't know how to code, you could follow along with the instructions and get started. So I like to do that with almost everything that I do, if I can. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, it's basically the history of the early-ish internet for personal sites. Um, like the talk title references, this is the 90s, but we're going to go back about Oh, I don't like doing the math to when this is, but yeah, 25 to 26 years ago. Um, so yeah, people were expressing themselves online in the 80s and 90s as well with like BBSs and stuff, but we're gonna talk about the history of the personal site. And we can't do that without talking about GeoCities and Angel Fire. So GeoCities was created in 1994 as a web hosting service. It was originally initiated as a beta program called Beverly Hills Internet. And the concept was to create cyber cities in which users would select a virtual city, and then they had like themes under that. So like Area 51, if you're super into aliens, or uh, you know Rodeo Drive for shopping and stuff like that. And so people would create their personal sites there or fan sites for the thing that they liked that was relevant to that thing. And like I say, thing a lot. You can find you know similar people that have interests um, of like what you have, and it was really nice. And so. Angel Fire was created in 1996 as a web hosting site, but it was also a medical transcription service. And once they saw like how the popularity of um, the hosting was taking off, they were like, "All right, let's just let's just stick to this." Um, 
And so while GeoCities had the neighborhoods feature for selecting your domain, AngelFire focused strictly on hobbies. So it would be like angelfire.com with two or more names and then directories um, that you would select from a pull down menu. So you could have like, all right, I live in New York and I like Pokemon. So you would have angelfire.com slash New York slash Pokemon and then the text for whatever your directory was. <laughs> and the key thing about GeoCities and AngelFire provided to consumers was that it was an understandable way to get a site up and running. Um, and I'm not really a fan of using words like easy or simple, but there really is no caveat here. They made it so it was really accessible to users. They both had simple control panels where you would be able to edit HTML files in a text box. Coupled with these simple editors, you would be able to find some other websites that you could copy and paste some code from. So you didn't have to code. And nobody was like judging you for that. If they were, you wouldn't hear about it anyway, which is kind of nice pre-social media. Um, and if you were a little bit more code savvy, you could use FTP. So it was basically the best of both worlds, simple static HTML and images, and you were good to go. So there were a lot of little communities that popped up giving you those copy and paste snippets. Um, so you could get like silly little cursors or have it snow on your web page. And it was just really about self-expression and having fun online, which I feel like everyone should always do. So now I'm gonna show you some examples of these websites. Um, so usually when I'm talking about old GeoCities or Angel Fire sites and I'm looking for images to use, I kind of feel like I'm stumbling on a stranger's diary because they were so personal and like I shouldn't be reading it, but obviously, you know, like they put that stuff out there. So the first one that I want to show you is Stephanie's Temple of Cool. She has a Hanson fan page, a Joe McIntyre fan page. He's from New Kids on the Block, if you know what that is, um, as well as a Fine Guy Shrine. Um, she also included links to pages that had her friends on it and other resources where you could get cool things for your page. My next example is just called Cute Boy Site, and it says, this is a place for girls, but if boys want to see pictures of boys too, I don't mind. So, you know, really ahead of the time. Um, I love the sentiment here, and it ends with, I hope your eyes are going to have a great time, which is just, you know, really nice. People were also making sites about sharing information, like this one, trying to teach other people how to create their own Doom levels. You don't have to watch like a 15 minute YouTube video to do it. You just get the info there. And then Jerry the Cat homepage, and this was in the Pettsburg neighborhood on GeoCities. Um, I like this one because Jerry the Cat's owners wrote a lot of dialogue about the life of Jerry. Um, so here are some of my favorites. The reason Jerry is so fat is because he can scalp food from anyone. If possible, he would gladly consume five or six normal meals. There's only one reason for this. He was raised by countless admirers who could not help but constantly feed his seemingly helpless butt. <laughs> and then this snippet. Here's Jerry in the hands of his humble owner. It's kind of refreshing to know sometimes that he remembers. He's a cool cat, but he doesn't particularly like to be touched. And pats are always welcomed, but only for a limited period. Who knows what goes on inside the mind of Jerry the Cat? So people would make sites for whatever reason they wanted. Who knows how many people would see it um, or how they would discover it. It's just something that you might have you know, shared with your friends or family, or you would find it from the Explore section. We're not even getting into web rings. I'm not going to touch that. Um, but yeah, so you could just find other pet lovers in the Pittsburgh section of GeoCities, and it's really nice. And then, in the early 2000s, a lot of things started happening that enabled the desire for more customization and discoverability. So social media started, specifically speaking, MySpace in 2003, and MySpace allowed users to use HTML and um, custom images to be able to customize your profile right there on the site. You could also put in some special secret JavaScript that would help you see who was viewing your page, which was definitely a third-party service. Um, so if you were a teenager, you were just like, oh, is my crush viewing my site? And then it sometimes was sad. Um, and then, of course, Neopets, which was founded in 1999. Not a social media site, per se, but a lot of people say that they got their start customizing their Neopets profiles. Um, I still have Neopets, and they're old enough to drive, which 
you know, that's pretty cool. So now on the personal website side, we had something else happening in the early 2000s. And in November 2000, a blogging software named Gray Matter was created by Noah Gray. And it's referred to alongside Cafe Log as being the inspiration for WordPress, which not a lot of people know. Um, it's, it's really cool. It was maintained by Noah for about two years and then taken over by a community of supporters. Um, during that time, it allowed for more people to like register and use it. And it didn't have a database. Its only requirement was that you had a web server uh, that had Perl on it. So it allowed people to have much more control over their content. And I've spoken about this part of website history at length before. And if you want to hear more about that, um, there's a Medium article called Keep the Internet Weird. And it's also the title of a talk that I gave at JSConfU, which is way more about this kind of grungy personal site thing. But since the early 2000s, the idea of the personal site hasn't really changed that much. You've got an about page, maybe a blog, a few other pages for information about yourself, but the technologies have grown exponentially, and so is the barrier to entry. So content management systems like WordPress, Drupal, Joomla dominated the rest of the 2000s, and if companies weren't using these, they were rolling out their own custom MVCs that they never wrote documentation for. Um, you had to start worrying about you know, templating for your layouts, databases to store your content. It wasn't just as simple to click as a user who wanted to go in and play around, really, unless you were still using GeoCities and AngelFire. Um, around 2010, we start seeing a lot more heavy emphasis on design, design systems when it comes to the front end, as well as a shift from PHP and Java over to JavaScript. And we're caring more about knowing stacks um, than you know, just wanting to put stuff out there. Which is why for the 2010s, I'm describing it best as like design and JavaScript times a thousand. Um, the market just gets entirely saturated with JavaScript and various frameworks and libraries. Node.js in 2009, Express in 2019, you know, Angular Backbone, you guys know, I don't have to tell you, we're at a JavaScript conference. Um, so there was like all at once a lot of different ways to accomplish the same idea. Um, this led to, at least for me personally, a burden of choice and just a ton of documentation to read um, for you to you know, just get up and running. And that's just the beginning, because now we have to worry about a system for our design as well. You know, Paul Irish released HTML5 boilerplate in 2010, and now we have to worry about SAS and less, and you know, a lot more CSS things. Um, <laughs> even more CSS libraries, tachyons, Bulma, Tailwind, et cetera, et cetera. So like, no matter the thing that you're trying to accomplish, there's numerous ways to do it. So what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do if you're a person who's not super technical? And so sure, we can't really go back to exactly how easy things were in the 90s. Um, we, we can go back to static sites and a more simple and streamlined developer experience. So, Jamstack has made that, like, in my opinion, uh, a lot more accessible for people. So Jamstack works by decoupling the front end from the back end, and you know, before deployment, the entire front end is pre-built into highly optimized static pages and assets, and this happens all in the build process. So you can pick and choose your own technologies and simplify the steps that it takes from writing your code to it showing up on the web. And that's personally why I like it, because it reminds me of how easy it was to you know, just get a fan site for a pop punk band I like up and running and out the door in like 15 minutes. It really you know, makes it that streamlined. So um, here are some of the more popular approaches to Jamstack style development. You've got Next.js, which is a minimalistic framework for server rendered React applications, as well as statically exported React apps. Hugo, which is a static site generator written in Go. Gatsby, another framework that allows you to create more minimal and fast React applica applications, which are also exported as static files. And then a ton more you can see at jamstack.org slash generators. And I know what you're thinking. Um, you just showed us a lot of technologies speaking about the burden of choice, and now I'm showing you even more. Um, it's a little bit different. You know, you don't have to worry about the server as much anymore. You don't have to know the full stack up and down. 
And hosting platforms like Netlify and Vercel make the process even easier. You just hook up your Git repository, and when you push to your branch, kicks off the static site generation um, based off of what tool you were using. And so you don't have to worry about the servers, CI, CD, CDNs, really, unless you want to. Um, you can just you know, write your code, and you're good to go. So I had a site in my head for a really long time um, that I wanted to build, and I knew that I wanted to try Jamstack slash serverless. And so let me show you what the project was, how I accomplished this, and how you can get started. So um, I've been to Japan a few times, and when I'm there, I'm obsessed with these photo booths, which are called Purikura. And so in Japan, that refers to a photo booth that um, basically has a station where you take your pictures and there's like a green screen and then you come out and you decorate them and it's really cool and you get stickers. If you have a round one arcade near you in the United States, they have them there. Highly recommend it. So it's just, you know, like a really fun thing to do with friends. And that's an example of the green screen one and then you move to the next section, which is the decorating one. And this is the funnest part. You've got a touch screen with pens that allow you to move through um, each photo that you took and add adjustments to the photo. So like you can put on makeup, you can draw things, you can add a ton of fun stickers. And um, I really liked doing this with my friends. It was, it was fun. So I knew that I wanted to recreate this experience, but how was I going to, you know, capture that in a COVID world when I couldn't hang out with my friends at the time. So I made Purry Booth. Um, Purry Booth is a React application generated into static assets. I'm utilizing WebAssembly for ultra-fast image filtering and Canvas for the photo decorating. It's hosted on Netlify, so I can just you know push changes as I need to, and it's automatically built. And um, I'm also using Datadog's real user monitoring, so I'm able to do some live A-B testing. Obviously, I'm not gonna do a ton of user metrics for my own personal site, but it helps, because I drew all the stickers and they're not that good. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to give you a demo now. Where's my mouse? All right, uh, control tab, control tab, no. How do you get to another tab in a browser? <laughs> Okay, you know what, I'm just gonna hit escape and go to it manually. Oh, it's not there, cool. There it is. All right, let's go back to full screen. So this is Purry Booth. It is purrybooth.com, so if you wanna try it out now, you totally can. It's fully respond, it works on mobile. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so, okay, don't tell me what to do. All right, so basically you come into the site, you can either take a picture with your webcam or you can upload a photo. So I'm going to upload a photo of Nicolas Cage. Um, and the next thing that I'm gonna do is, you know, add some filters. None of these images are stored because I don't wanna deal with people doing things on the internet and being liable for that. So it's all just like local cache stuff. Um, all right, let's give him Let's do three, no, let's make it cute. Let's rose tint him. And then let's go over to the decorate page. And so this is the canvas part, which is really fun to figure out how to do. Um, you can basically select all of these. I'm gonna make him a cat boy. Um, all of the stickers, you can resize, you can rotate, you can add them up and down, um, you know, as if they were, um, a layer, you can remove them if you want. Let's give them a little, oh, those are cherries, that's not a bow. Well, that's good, so I don't want the cherries, so I can remove that, and I'll just add a really cute heart. Um, obviously, I could go real wild on this. Um, let's, let's just give them some more sparkles and call it a day. So then you hit let's share, takes it out of the canvas, gives you an image that you can save, and it's really fast. It's simple to use, and it basically achieves what I was looking for um, from what I missed with those websites that I could use, or that I, or not websites, photo booths that I used to use. So now let me show you how I did that. You come back over here, you go full screen again. All right, so that was the demo, obviously. <laughs> 
Um, so now I'll tell you a little bit about the technical details. Um, I knew that I needed a simple React app and that all my components were gonna be React hooks. It's a single page application, so I wasn't worrying about any routing at all, um, which is kind of annoying if you need to start over, but it was quick, so. Um, so yeah, so to start up this product project, I used React App Rewired. Um, it lets you tweak the create React app webpack configs without using eject and without creating a fork of the React scripts. And it's got all of the benefits of create React app without the limitation of no config, which was great. Um, you can add in plugins, loaders, whatever you needed. And I did need some loaders for the image manipulation library, which I'll get into next. So um, I have a lot of experience with JavaScript image manipulation libraries. One particular one that I've used many times before and wish to never use again is called Image Magic. And so um, it's not fun and I was like, I'm never gonna use it again. So when I started this project, I was like, I have to try something else. I'm sure there's gonna be you know, some other image manipulation libraries I could use like Cayman.js. Pika, Lina.js, or Compressor.js, um, but I decided to go a slightly different route for this because I just, you know, stumbled upon. Oh yeah, never again. I forgot I made a little animation. I really hate image magic. Um, so, and the route that I took was Photon. So, Photon is um, an image processing library in WebAssembly that runs both natively and on the web. Um, I chose Photon because it's four to ten times faster than JavaScript. Um, it also has over 90 fu functions built in already, including some filters, um, channel slash color manipulation, resizing and correction, and so it took a ton of the heavy photo manipulation work out of the way. And there was also a quick start uh, for Node. So it was really easy to grab the package and easily adapt it. Not, I'm saying easy again, but you know what I mean. It was, it was fairly straightforward to adapt it down to like the drop down filtering that I needed. Um, and the configuration override that you need for the WebAssembly to work with React was also in the Photon repository. So I didn't have to overthink that part either. And finally, the last thing, which is arguably like the most important part of the entire project, was the sticker decorations. <laughs> it was also the most difficult um, when dealing with Canvas elements. There's like a ton of libraries that are very finicky, very dated. You know, some of them aren't maintained. That's dated. They're dated. You know, people don't keep up with it. Um, and I did not want to write this from scratch. Um, so I used fabric.js. It fit like all of the things that I needed for it. It allows for the images to be resized, rotated, and dragged. It supports image grouping, so you can mass delete items, and then you can also move the layers up and down as if it was like a Z index. So now that I have all of the technical elements that I needed, it was time for me to deploy, and this is where the title of my talk comes from. So I missed the simplicity of being able to edit all in one place and have my site be ready to go. And Netlify made the process like just how it kind of was, obviously a lot, well, not exactly how it was, but it like gave me that excited feeling of being able to get something out there in like a matter of minutes. And so since I was already using GitHub for my repo, I signed up for an account at Netlify. I don't work at Netlify, it's just great to use. Um, I set up my domain to point at their servers and build and deploy. I set up my GitHub repo with the build command and the directory um, to be published once it's built, and that was it. Now every single time I push to my main branch, Netlify knows, kicks off that build process and the deploy process. I don't have to go to multiple sites. I don't have to do you know, multiple configurations anywhere. I don't even need to leave my code editor if I'm using VS Code with like the command line built in. It's really convenient um, and has inspired me to make more things. However, I did run into some issues once I started having friends and family testing the site, but obviously that's because I wrote the code, so they were finding my bugs that I did not. And so when I started letting people try it, I was noticing some errors that were only happening on mobile. I was also noticing some people were having different interaction behaviors with the images that I didn't expect, so I didn't have it supported. So, you know, holding and dragging versus clicking. I needed to add in a draggability interaction. And so the things that my friends and family were telling me they were having issues with were easy enough for me to implement, but, um, 
it would have been easier for me to have like a bigger picture view if I was actually gonna make other people besides my friends and family use it, and that's why I just threw in the monitoring to track user behavior. I put custom clickers on the images, and with a few lines of code, I could like A-B test in the browser and figure that stuff out, which was awesome and quick, and I know this says thank you, but I'm not done yet. So um, it was cool because I, you know, got to hire my friends. I commissioned my friend, let's go back to the, to the one that has like the picture of the Puri booth thing. Um, I got to pay my friend to make this pixel icon for me. I got to pay my friends to make the stickers for me. So like, not only was I making something because I wanted to be able to be close with my friends when I couldn't, I was also able to involve them and like compensate them for it, which was really cool and fun. And so like by way of all of these new-ish ways that we're able to, you know, come up with an idea and get it out there in the world, it has like reinvigorated my creativity. And I hope that this will maybe, you know, inspire some of you to like try some stuff that you haven't been trying out in a while and get it out there and get it up and going. And so I guess to summarize, while the 90s are back in style right now, um, you can also get up and running as easy as it was to get up and running then. Um, and if you want to see the code for this, it is at github.com slash Rachel Nicole slash Um Thanks.